Okay, so this is Wednesday, the 23rd of August of the year 2023. It is 4.22 in the afternoon, and you'll most likely see this probably Friday, because that's usually the day on which I am uh, want to post videos. So I'm not sure if I've addressed this particular topic before in a video, uh, and I'm much too lazy to uh, go back through my almost five years worth of videos in order to see that I have referenced it or not. But nevertheless, I wanted to, I suppose, relate to you the inception of the idea for my very first story that I ever wrote, and uh, also how I intend to possibly develop the idea further and maybe make it something great in the very near future. So, this is the very first story that I wrote as an original composition, this is not the uh, Lost World rewrite that I did when I was 13 or so. I did a whole video about that, and you can go ahead and watch that if you like, uh, somewhere on this channel. But uh, this is actually the first story, short story, that I had written and completed on my own, and that was all solely me. I suppose, my first original story. So, I suppose I'll get into it here. Uh, so, the origins behind this particular story is that uh, during my, I suppose, 11th form of secondary school, uh, I just, I suppose this was maybe my second or third or maybe f even fourth year, of very intense reading of all sorts of classic authors, uh, the ones whom uh, were most prominent during those days obviously were Arthur Conan Doyle and H.G. Wells, but I read a whole bunch of others, uh, such as uh, Lewis Carroll and... Uh, A.E.W. Mason, I remember I had read, or at least partly read, his book, The Four Feathers, because uh, it had inspired uh, Miriam C. Cooper to make a film of the same name. And also I'd been reading Paul Deschai's works on Africa, which obviously I've talked about at length on this channel. And uh, I'm hoping to do a more in-depth video just on Dushayo himself, but uh, that will come at another day. So, basically, uh, through just taking in all sorts of literature, you naturally uh, come to hear about quite a few people uh, through osmosis and just general discussion, even though there weren't necessarily that many bookish people in my school, apart from the librarians and this one girl who had uh, very notably read Jane Eyre through the course of a lecture and was, I suppose, told off because of it. But uh, nevertheless, uh, one of the uh, writers that I had heard quite a bit about through Osmosis in, I suppose, connection with... Uh, a lot of these horror stories that I've been reading is uh, H.P. Lovecraft. And now, as you know, I'm a very great admirer of Lovecraft. Um, I very much enjoy his uh, weird fiction, his Kalalu mythos, and uh, particularly also some of his stories that are not necessarily set within the wider mythos, uh, like uh, The Outsider or The Terrible Old Man and... Uh, I think uh, the picture in the house, all those types of stories, uh, are good standalone tales. And uh, 
I had heard quite a bit about him and uh, naturally uh, asked for uh, a volume of his uh, short fiction for Christmas of that year. It was 2015. And the volume that I ended up getting was Necronomicon, The Best Weird Tales of H.P. Lovecraft, which I still have. I was thinking of getting rid of it, but I realized that that particular volume has so much sentimental value to me, and especially considering that my brother had got it for me, that I couldn't bear to part with it. So I decided just to keep it, even though I myself do have the complete fiction now. And uh, obviously, uh, when I did initially get it, I'd read a lot of the stories out of that, mainly the... Mo- the more famous ones, such as The Call of Kalalu and uh, At the Mountains of Madness and uh, <sighs> all those other ones. And uh, obviously, as you know, uh, Lovecraft is the, uh, the writer of the single piece of fiction that actually managed to frighten me, which was called The Hound. I did a whole video about that, A Snack and a Story in which I detailed how, after reading that story, I was alone in the house and I could have sworn that I had heard the the baying of a spectral hound or something just outside my window and how it was very, a very eerie feeling after reading that. But, uh, so, the year after that, in about 2016, as I was, you know, sort of getting more into Lovecraft, I had realized that uh, alongside him, there were a number of writers uh, contemporaneous to uh, this this great man, whom had set stories in his own universe, and basically he had compiled them together and had basically cross-referenced them to make it seem as though that the events in the stories actually did occur. And uh, some of these writers included people like Clark Ashton Smith, whom I've read a few things by, and I actually do have a story about him that uh, I will tell one of these old days. Uh, There's also August Derelith, whom I'm yet to read. But the one whom had basically presented himself to me almost really quite suddenly was uh, Robert E. Howard. Now, obviously, Robert E. Howard was the author of uh, and creator of Conan. Uh, I haven't really read much of his, uh, of those type of stories, but uh, nevertheless, uh, I found out uh, through a very unlikely source that he evidently had uh, written pastiches of Lovecraft, uh, set in his Kalala Mathos, and uh, back in, uh, as I said, in my school days, uh, I was on very good terms with the uh, school librarians, and uh, had access to whatever books would be donated uh, from either bookshops or estates, or however they would get their and uh, basically these books would be set aside and collected and determined whether they would be put into the system or not. And because I happened to be the most bookish person uh, who would come by, I got first dibs on most of these books. And I procured quite a lot of my library. Because of that, I had acquired quite a lot of uh, Penguin Classics uh, the black ones, you know, the uh, the older ones from, I suppose, the 1980s, uh, that way. And these were all for free. I didn't have to pay a dime for any of these things. And uh, I think I got rid of most of them because uh, a lot of them were just histories, like classical histories and such and all that, which could well be good to uh, to know. But as a writer of fiction, I suppose, really, you're... Uh, your priorities are someplace else. So I decided to get rid of them. But nevertheless, uh, I was 
rooting through these uh, boxes of books, when I came across one particular volume, and I have it here, let me go and get it. It's a volume uh, called Kulalu, the Mythos and Kindred Horrors. And uh, the cover had these very ornate looking letters that you know, spelled out Kulalu and such. And uh, basically the image of, uh, you know, the elder god himself or itself was uh, in, in the form of, I suppose, a, a green alabaster statue was on front of the uh, cover, in f uh, which itself was backed by a, a velvet, a purple velvet curtain uh, in front of a, back, a black background. And I noticed that uh, the particular writer of these stories was uh, Robert E. Howard. And uh, I thought that this was the find of the year for me, especially out of those, uh, all of those books that I had uh, acquired through the, that mass of donations. And I naturally decided to take it home with me and, uh, and read it. And the first story that I had read out of there was called The Black Stone. Now, it's been many years since I had read this particular tale, but I believe it's about a man who goes up to the mountains in Hungary and researches about this, uh, I suppose, this, this mysterious stone monolith in the mountains that is, I suppose, is a sacrificial altar of ill repute. And I believe uh, people get sacrificed to this giant toad-like creature who comes out and brutally slaughters them. And I, I was so captivated by that story uh, that, to be honest, at that time, I almost liked it better than anything by Lovecraft <laughs> at the time. Been many years since I've read it though, so I may need to go back and reread it. But uh, nevertheless, what's funny is that uh, it was this story by Robert E. Howard and not Lovecraft that actually compelled me to write this particular story that I'm going to talk about. And I wrote it in a very feverish sprint of about, I don't know maybe a couple of days. It didn't take me very long to write a short story back then. I haven't written a short story in many years. Uh, I don't know exactly how long it would take me, but uh, we'll see. Uh, I might get back into it here soon. I don't know. We'll see. But uh, I wrote it very quickly. And uh, the story, as I said, it was very heavily inspired not only by Le by uh, Robert E. Howard, but also by Lovecraft, because I thought I may as well set it in the Kololu mythos, because as a young 16-year-old writer, that may well be a good start into the whole literary landscape to sort of uh, make your name known, and then you would branch off into uh, other avenues of your own afflators, I suppose. And... The particular tale, the, the title of this particular tale was uh, Egypticus, A-E-G-Y-P-T-I-C-U-S, I believe that's how you spell it. Now, that will most likely mean almost nothing to the layman, outside of maybe it has something or other to do with Egyptology. But to the more cultured individual, particularly well-versed in paleontology, you will know that that, in fact, is, I suppose, the scientific name of the Spinosaurus, who is, or which is, well, to be honest, don't get me started on the whole debate as to what it actually looked like and such and all that, but nevertheless, it was a very f big, formidable uh, theropod dinosaur 
and uh, I had very much liked it and thought that uh, I may as well write a story about it. And the basic plot details that I can remember from it were thus. Essentially, it was about an island in the South Pacific. Uh, I believe it was, I don't know, (laughs) far west or far east of Sumatra or something like that. And basically, it's about an expedition by the narrator, whom is unnamed, and he goes over to this irascible professor who uh, wants to prove this uh, claim as to, uh, you know, I suppose he wants to explore this island and such and bring back whatever evidence uh, is there from it to, uh, I believe it's England that they were, that they were dispatched from. And he is accompanied by, I think, a Norwegian uh, as the companion, the fearless companion. So it's three people who uh, venture to this island in the South Pacific. And basically, once there, they find that the natives are very... Um, well, they, they, they have very strange customs. I'm not entirely certain as to what most of them are, but nevertheless... Uh, the natives are there and they decide to, you know, set up camp and such. And they notice that basically their guide, this uh, Norwegian, is gone uh, and uh, in the night. And they trek through the jungle. And they see that basically he is on a sacrificial altar uh, in the middle of this glade. And uh, these natives are dousing him with pig's blood and uh, essentially they're going to offer him up to this wild beast uh, that resides in the forest that is basically their god. And what this beast ends up being is an albino, or albino, however you would say it, albino or albino, tomato, tomato, Spinosaurus. And... It was very graphic as to how uh, this particular fellow had perished and such. And uh, basically, they saw this and said that they wouldn't speak about it. They'd try to get off the island as soon as they could. But eventually, I suppose, somehow or other, the professor or, uh, or the narrator gets nabbed or something and they end up in the same sacrificial sort of situation and but evidently the island sort of collapses and ends up sinking and (sighs) i suppose to sort of justify its place in the kalalu mythos kalalu himself had to make an appearance and basically as the island is sinking and as the professor is dying perhaps being eaten by the spinosaurus i don't know i don't remember uh the narrator in his final moments of consciousness before uh, he basically passes out, sees this giant monster that has the body of a dragon and the head of an octopus. And after that, he loses consciousness, wakes up on a steamship and tells of this island that uh, had basically just sunk and was... uh, Inhabited by these natives who uh, worshipped the Spinosaurus and uh, sacrificed them to uh, sacrifice folks to uh, this particular animal, and he's basically told that such an island never existed, and it basically ends with him sort of succumbing to madness. And uh, I think the last line of it was that I began to laugh and laugh and laugh, and I haven't been able to stop since. And that is basically the story behind my very first story, Egypticus. And the story itself, it's lost, to be honest with you. I have no idea where the original manuscript is. But you can see, I mean, it's there's a good idea there for uh, 
a sort of compelling, interesting kind of a horror tale, but it sort of devolved into just really random nonsense. It just didn't seem to make a whole lot of uh, coherent sense at all. Uh, but uh, it just seemed almost like I had the germ of an idea, but didn't necessarily have the uh, the brains to execute it properly. And uh, I'm hoping maybe this time, one of these days, I might be able to. And you could probably tell from her, you know, this is my very first story that I wrote that I was very much inspired by what I was reading. Uh, I think I had tried to read Journey of the Center of the Earth by Jules Verne or Yule Verne at the time and just was having a rough time with it. And it found the dynamic of three people there was uh, fitting enough for my tale. And the fact that the press professor was irrational was indicative of uh, Conan Doyle's challenger though he looked nothing like Challenger. It was described as nothing like that. In fact, I think I describe him as having the face of a dodo bird <laughs> or something like that. And uh, so there's inspiration there. And uh, what I'm thinking is that perhaps instead of trying to shove in Lovecraft's own mythology alongside my own. Why not go about it this way? Maybe if... I, I'm going to tell you right now. I'm a Christian. I've been one for three years. And I cannot justifiably say that I believe in dinosaurs. I just cannot. Because it there's such a contradictory race that really they seem to defy creation, and in my estimation, God wouldn't have created uh, a species or really an order of creatures that could well be interpreted in whatever way, shape, or form, and just be mislabeled and misclassified all these years down. It just is a whole bunch of nonsense. And so I thought, what if you know, instead of, you know, these reports of these various elder gods, these old ones and such, instead of them being sort of, you know, things from the sea and such and all that and these uh, very strange entities that come down from the space and whatnot, what if what these people are actually seeing are just dinosaurs, but they just had never seen one before, and because of that, it basically did not properly register in their heads and therefore they were driven mad at trying to comprehend it. And uh, obviously I've experimented with this concept before. Uh, I had a story that I narrated on here called Of the Glorification of the City of Scar, which is basically about this coastal town uh, who worships, uh, or doesn't worship, I'm not entirely sure what happened. They they sort of uh, basically go about their wicked ways and uh, they don't work, they don't basically contribute to society at all. And then the sea race sort of uh, comes up and says, you know, uh, you will see the wrath of our, God and such and all that. I don't remember exactly the details of the story, but nevertheless, uh, this God happens to come out of the sea and is flippered and was called Thalassophenia. If you don't know, that is the scientific classification for Lyploridon, which was a giant marine reptile that lived around the Jurassic era. And... So you can see I've experimented with that idea before and I think it would perhaps suit me well if I were to adapt this skeleton of an idea to that concept and just perhaps make it just a bit longer, make the characters a bit deeper and uh, 
almost novella length and just make it over, overall overall a better story and uh, that's pretty much the story behind uh, my very first short story Egypticus without having written that I suppose I wouldn't have gone on to write several bad short stories which eventually culminated into uh, cicadas or cicadas which uh, to be honest with you is probably the best one out of that lot and without that I probably would not have uh, written my first attempt at long-form narrative fiction, which I'll talk about here very soon. Without having done that, I probably wouldn't have tried experimenting with uh, less semi-autobiographical fiction in an unfinished mystery, and without having done that, I wouldn't have written, or at least partially written, a more spiritually-minded work. So you can see that this one little tale was very influential to me, and I say, as, and is I suppose the groundwork for the whole of my uh, the whole of my uh, corpus or corpus in progress. And uh, one of these days, I'll return to it. I, as I said, I have the skeleton of the idea at my disposal, but I don't have the actual first draft. I have no idea where that's at. But one of these days, I'll probably write it. I know I've read out some of it early on this year, not this year, maybe late last year, that I revised and such. And, uh, well, I didn't revise, I just basically wrote it because I didn't have anything to go off of. But nevertheless, I will at some point get around to it. And uh, maybe I'll read it on the channel, I don't know. But I want to try and see if I can write it and maybe get it shipped out for publication in a magazine or whatever. We'll see. Anyway, that was today's video, basically detailing the, I suppose, the genesis of my first story, uh, Egypticus. And uh, perhaps, maybe, if you have uh, any similar tales as to any stories that you've written, if at the beginning of your writing life uh, and their inspirations, do leave them down below or perhaps make your own response video. I'd very much like to hear from you. And uh, that's it. Tune in next week for uh, hopefully uh, an another more interesting video. And we will see you here very soon. I wish you a very good morning, midday, afternoon, evening, midnight, whenever you intend on seeing this, and uh, we will see you here very soon. Cheers.